Classes. This is Mr. Burnett. Uh, we're going to try something new. We're going to uh, try to do these lessons um, with my PowerPoints that I'd use in class, uh, but we're going to try to do them remotely. Uh, I'll publish them or post them up, and you can click on them and, and watch them uh, at your own house or wherever you are sheltering in place. So this will be the first one, so hopefully this works. Now, you should have looked at the first several slides of this PowerPoint on your own. I printed it off, uh, put it in the packets, also put it up on Google Classroom. So you should have looked at the first several slides that talked about the beginning of the Civil War and how Fort Sumter uh, really started the Civil War. Uh, then there was a couple slides giving you very brief uh, biographical information of some of the key players, uh, Lincoln and Ulysses Grant. Uh, for the Union, the North, and Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee for the South, the Confederacy. So this lecture, I want to talk about uh, the war's early years. Uh, now, if you're on my uh, Zoom call a week or two ago, uh, you remember me telling you that the war lasts literally almost exactly four years, almost to the day. Uh, Fort Sumner uh, took place uh, in April 18. 61. Uh, Lee is going to surrender uh, at Appomattox Courthouse in April of 1865, and Lincoln will be uh, assassinated and killed just a few days after that. So the war is pretty much exactly four years long. And this year I want to talk about uh, just the early years of the war. There we go. Okay, the Union, or the North, strategy uh, was called the Anaconda Plan. Now, this was developed by General Winfield Scott. Uh, he had actually been the head general for the Union Army uh, for about 20 years at this point. He was one of the heroes of the Mexican-American War on the American side. Uh, he had actually fought uh, during the War of 1812. Uh, which gives you a sense of how old he was. And he'd been in the military for basically 50 years, 50 plus years, by the time the Civil War breaks out. So he is the head general for the Union Army when war breaks out. And he develops uh, what they call the Anaconda Plan. And as you can see on the graphic and the map uh, on the right of your screen, uh, the plan was basically just to, to sort of squeeze and smother uh, the South. Okay, What they uh, had planned to do, they meaning the Union, the North, planned to do was to blockade uh, the South. Uh, we've seen the importance of these blockades throughout the other wars we, we've discussed in this class. Remember, it was uh, the, the blockade in Yorktown. Remember, General Washington had the French uh, Navy uh, blockade uh, Yorktown that allowed uh, Rochambeau and General Washington to bring their armies and block in uh, the British General Cornwallis in Yorktown and ultimately lead to victory during the Revolutionary War. All right, so we saw how a blockade uh, worked effectively there. During the War of 1812, we talked a lot about how the British blockade of America really was one of the first things. I wasn't the only, but it was one of the first things that caused America to really start manufacturing for themselves. Well, Scott's going to use the same type of plan on the South. He's going to blockade the South because, speaking of manufacturing, where are most of the factories and manufacturing plants in the U.S.? That's right. They're in the North. All right. Very, very little manufacturing is taking place in the South. So the South is dependent upon... Uh, Whatever supplies they need, they're going to have to get them from Europe. Uh, the North is obviously not going to sell them to them. So they're going to have to import things from Europe. All right, so the South very much needs its ports open. So the, the plan was, well, if you use Union ships to blockade the, the South and the East Coast, and then if the, the Union Army can get control of the Mississippi River, because let's review something we've talked a lot about this year, if you control the Mississippi River, what do you control? That's right. You control trade basically in North America. 
Okay, the Mississippi River, as I've mentioned before, in the early and mid 1800s, it was like a highway and an airport and a train track all rolled into one. It, it had to do everything with transportation and movement in certainly the middle part of the United States during the 1800s. So the North plan was to blockade the coast and then control the Mississippi River and basically be able to strangle or or squeeze the, the South to death, so to speak. Okay. So, and that's why it gets the name Anaconda Plan. All right. This is how an anaconda snake kills its prey, smothers them uh, by squeezing them tight. So, the North wanted to cut off all supplies to the South because, as we, you've learned in your previous lessons the last two weeks, the North had a great advantage in terms of materials. Excuse me. They had way more people. They had a lot more factories, uh, more of the nation's railroad tracks were located within the Union. So the Union felt that it was set up for a long war. Now, as we'll talk shortly, they didn't actually think the war was going to last very long, but they at least were set up for it better than the South. So they wanted to uh, strangle the Confederate with the Anaconda plan. Now, I'm going to go on, but as obviously... Throughout all these slides and these lectures, if you need more time, I'll try to give you as much time to write down the information, take your notes. Uh, but if you do need more time, uh, just hit pause and take all the notes. And I do want to use in Cornell style notes. You need to be writing your, your main ideas or vocabulary words on the left and you'd be summarizing each page of notes at the bottom. Continue doing that. And uh, these lectures, I'll try to keep them fairly short to give you plenty of time to pause them and take your notes. OK, as I had just uh, said, many in the North and the South, for that matter, uh, assumed the war would be over quickly. Uh, the North realized their mistake, though, when the South started winning a lot of battles. If you remember from your previous lessons about the advantages, North had the advantages in terms of manpower and materials. But the South had a lot of the, the more experienced generals on their side. Uh, not all because the Union did have uh, Scott, General Scott, as I mentioned. However, he was 75 years old and pretty much after coming up with the Anaconda plan, he retires. All right, he's not going to spend the next several you know, years of his life in his late 70s fighting battles and sleeping on grounds and in tents and things like that. So he retires and the North doesn't have a whole lot of experienced generals after him. But the South did. Uh, a lot of the Southern generals had a lot of experience in the military. So they start winning the first several battles. Uh, they won Fort Sumner, uh, which we talked about uh, last week. They win uh, the, both the first and second battles of Bull Run. In the south, it's called Manassas, uh, this battle. The first one took place in 1861. Uh, the south won. The second one takes place in 1862, the summer of 1862. Uh, the south wins that as well. And again, it has two names. In the north, they call it the Battle of Bull Run. Uh, in the south, it's always been referred to as the Battle of Manassas because that was the uh, one of the cities or areas in Virginia where they were fighting. And finally, uh, what's called the Seven Days Battle. Uh, you can probably guess how long this battle took place. Yes, only seven days. Um, I know the Seven Years' War actually lasted nine years, uh, but the Seven Days Battle really did only last seven days. And particularly the second battle of Bull Run, the seven day battles, this is, is where uh, General Re Lee, excuse me, General Robert E. Lee really starts to gain his fame uh, as a quality general for the, uh, I'm sorry, for the Confederacy. Uh, and he's, he's really going to be revered throughout the South and Confederacy for the rest of this war. Uh, and they're going to have a lot of respect for him. And it's at these battles where he really kind of lays, begins his claim to, to fame. These Confederate victories we just talked about all took place in the South. Uh, in fact, all of those I think I'd listen on that last slide. I think they may have all been in Virginia. Even uh, The Union fares better, though, in the North and in the West. For example, on uh, April 6th or 7th, 1862, 
uh, the Union wins the Battle of Shiloh. It's in the Tennessee, uh, and I know today uh, we don't consider Tennessee in the West, but back then, remember, uh, almost all the population was, was basically on one side of the Appalachian Mountains or the other. Now, the Tennessee was still kind of considered the West, and uh, the Union won that battle. Now, that's the battle, or at least one of them, where Ulysses Grant for the North uh, starts to become famous uh, and starts to take control. Ulysses Grant was not the general at the start of the war. As I said, Winfield Scott was a Union general when the war breaks out. He retires. Uh, Lincoln uh, then puts a guy named General McClellan in charge of the Union Army. Uh, Grant wasn't even a general when the war broke out. In fact, he wasn't even in the Army. He had been in the Army earlier in his life, uh, but he was he had actually left the Army. Uh, for about 10 years, basically a failed farmer, a failed businessman. Uh, but when war breaks out, he rejoins the army and he's not a general, but he quickly gets promoted. And the Battle of Shiloh is one of the early battles that he wins that really uh, kind of sets him on the path of ultimately taking over the Union Army. Uh, so anyway, this is one of the bloodiest battles of the war and the Union won it. All right, in two days, the Union North suffered 13,000 casualties, and the Confederacy and South suffered 11,000 casualties. I'm assuming some of you are thinking, wait a minute. You just told us the Union won this battle, but they had more casualties, and that's true. And you will see this for a lot of Civil War battles. The Union often will lose more men all right, and suffer more casualties. But because they had so many more men in the North that they could put into the army, that even if the two sides basically lost the same number of casualties, the South always had to retreat or back off or sooner uh, because they, could, they couldn't afford to lose as many men as the North, basically. So over the course of the, the war, uh, the Union, uh, and our estimates vary, but, but as I recall, the Union loses about 100,000 more men. Uh, than the South. All right. There was actually more more soldiers in the North uh, died in the Civil War than the South, even though the Union ultimately wins the war. Uh, so you see this. So you can't just look at to see who which side lost the, the most soldiers. You basically see which side had to give up the, the land, the territory they were fighting over first. Right. A few weeks after Shiloh, Union forces also captured New Orleans and the mouth of the Mississippi River. Again, if you control the Mississippi River, you can control the trade in North America. So, at least in the West, this Anaconda plan is being put into um, effect. The North is now in control of New Orleans by basically mid-1862. So they can, once again, keep supplies from going in or out of these southern ports that are blockading, controlling New Orleans. That's why, for those of you who had me for Texas history last year, you'll remember I uh, said that one of the big roles that Texas played uh, during the Civil War uh, was basically uh, to provide provisions uh, to the rest of the army. Uh, Texas could get items in either through its coast or up through Mexico and then distribute them to the rest of the Confederacy. All right, that was one of the big keys Texas played during the Civil War, because very early on, the blockade in the East Coast and then the control of New Orleans by the Union uh, really uh, kind of isolated uh, the Confederacy from the rest of the world. This is going to be a bigger problem um, in a couple lectures from now. We'll get into what happens once the Confederacy loses uh, the entire Mississippi River. For now, at this time, uh, they've lost the port. They can't get things in and out, but they can at least send things up and down the river in the interior part of the country. Okay. Shift back to the east now. After uh, the Seven Days Battle, after the Second Battle of Bull Run, 
General Lee decided it was time for him to invade the North. Almost all the battles in the Civil War take place within the Confederacy. Uh, General Lee is twice going to invade the North. As we're going to see, it goes badly for the South both times, for the Confederate Army, and General Lee has to escape back to the South. But the first time was in 1862, and he determines uh, that if he's going to try to bring a quick end to the war, he needs to invade uh, the North. So after his, his victories in Virginia at Second Battle of Bull Run or Manassas and the Seven Days Battle, he decides uh, the time is right to invade the North. So uh, he invades the North and meets the Union Army led by General McClellan at the Battle of Antietam. Uh, this becomes the bloodiest day in American history. Uh, the two sides combined to suffer between 22 and 25,000 casualties. Uh, now, that's roughly the same numbers that were lost at Shiloh, uh, but Shiloh took place over two days. Uh, the Battle of Antietam is one day, and up to about 25,000 soldiers uh, were either killed or wounded. But ultimately, uh, Lee has to retreat because, again, he has so many fewer men than the North does. He loses about a third of his army, and so he has to retreat back to Virginia. However, General McClellan fails to follow up and misses a chance to destroy Lee's army. All right, so Lee had already lost a third of his men. His men are tired, battered, uh, they're retreating back to, uh, to Virginia. McClellan, the Union general, thinks his men are too tired to chase after Lee, uh, so he lets them rest, and Lee gets away. And this did not make Lincoln very happy, uh, and he fires McClellan two months later. Now, it wasn't just because of this one battle. Uh, Lincoln had been impatient with McClellan for a while, didn't think McClellan was being aggressive enough or pursuing the war uh, hard enough. Uh, McClellan was very conservative, uh, didn't really want to fight unless uh, the odds were greatly in his favor. And so Lincoln was frustrated, and he fires him. Uh, and McClellan apparently didn't like being fired because once 1864 rolls around, he's going to run for president against Lincoln. So the two of them aren't done with each other. Uh, but Lincoln does fire him, so McClellan's uh, no longer in charge of the Union Army. However, uh, the Battle of Antietam, it did stop Lee's invasion into the north. It was considered a great victory uh, for the Union. Uh, and so this is going to give Lincoln a chance to announce the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, and that will be the subject of our next lecture. And I will talk to you then uh, in a couple days.